Hello, ma'am. Shall we start? Hello, ma'am. Yes, just uh, I request uh, Rohit. Uh, there are a couple of people in waiting room. Yeah, we can let them in. Yes, Runme, we can start. Yes. Thank you, madam. Shells sink, dreams float, life's good on our boat. A famous quote by Jimmy Buffet. Indeed, I couldn't agree more. Once you have tasted the life on board, you can't resist yourself from selling. A very good morning to one and all. On behalf of Center of Excellence in Maritime Studies, University of Mumbai, I, Brunmai Rane, faculty at Sindhu Swadhyay Sansa, University of Mumbai, cordially welcome you all to this inaugural webinar on India's Maritime Strategic Imperatives. Greetings on the occasion of the 11th International Day of the Seafarer, which was celebrated yesterday all across the world. And today we are here to commemorate the occasion. The International Maritime Organization, INO, celebrates every June 25th as the International Day of the Seafarer to recognize the contribution that seafarers make to the world trade and to the economy by conducting the sea transport. The theme for the present year is seafarer at the core of shipping's future. The theme seeks to increase the visibility of seafarer by drawing the inestimable role they play now and will continue to play in future. The role of the seafarers often goes underappreciated within the maritime industry and by the general public too. Hence, the day provides us the opportunity to show our gratitude to them towards their service. So let's take a moment and say thank you to all the seafarers. CMAS considered this occasion as a golden opportunity to be golden opportunity and decided to flag off its engagement with the maritime world with this inaugural lecture on India's maritime strategic imperatives. We are really overwhelmed that today you all are with us to celebrate the occasion. After the months of preparation, the voyage has finally begun. So why to wait? Welcome on board. Here, I would also like to congratulate to all the participants who are eager to take up the challenges in the maritime domain. I wish you good luck for all your ambitions. Let your dreams set sail. Now, 
I would like to request Dr. Anuradha Majumdar, Dean, Faculty of Science and Technology, University of Mumbai, and in charge director, Center of Excellence in Maritime Studies, University of Mumbai, to welcome all the dignitaries and participants present for the webinar. Over to you, Dr. Majumdar, madam. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Nirmay. A good head start today. A nice morning in the monsoons, especially in Mumbai. Uh, a very good morning to all from the Center of Excellence in Maritime Studies. I would especially like to welcome our resource person uh, of today's webinar, uh, Vice Admiral Sanjay J. Singh, AVSM NM, Controller of Personnel Services, Indian Navy, New Delhi. Our moderator of today's session, Commodore Dr. Srikant Kesnur, VSM, Director Maritime Warfare Center, Mumbai, and Officer in Charge, Naval History Project. All the university authorities, dignitaries from University of Mumbai, dignitaries from the Indian Navy, people who have joined, esteemed members who have joined from the Merchant Navy, uh, esteemed advisory body members of Center for Excellence in Maritime Studies, members of the Board of Studies in Maritime Studies, head of the departments, principals, faculty, scientists, students, my colleagues, and my co-citizens of India. We are indeed happy to state that at the inauguration of CMAS on 8th of February this year, we had wit witnessed the August presence of Admiral Karambir Singh, Chief of Naval Staff, along with an Honorable Governor, Sri Bhagat Singh Koshyari Ji, and the Director General of CSIR, Center for Scientific and Industrial Research, Dr. Shekhar Mande. And today, as we flag off the first webinar of CMAS post it, its inauguration, we have with us the esteemed presence of our resource person, Vice Admiral Sanjay Singh, an eloquent speaker on India's maritime strategy. I would also like to say that uh, uh, Vice Admiral Sanjay, uh, when he was the commandant of the uh, Naval War College, and even today has been a great supporter uh, of CMAS and one, one of the instrumental person in conceptualizing uh, the basic aspects and the map, uh, the roadmap of the Center for Excellence and Maritime Studies. Thanks a lot, sir. Mm -hmm. Further, uh, the talk will be moderated by Commodore Srikant Kesnur, another erudite uh, person from the Indian Navy. So uh, we are indeed privileged to have you all with us. I hope you have an enriching and interesting session because I know people have joined from various domains in today's webinar. So without much ado, let me introduce our moderator, Commodore Kesnoor. Let me tell you, uh, the, this has been abridged to a pricey kind of a thing for all the CVs. Uh, we can go on and on when we introduce both our moderator and our speaker of today's webinar. So Commodore Srikant Kesnur is an alumnus of the prestigious National Defense Academy, was commissioned in the Indian Navy in July 1986. In his 35-year career, he has had extensive experience in maritime operations, training, leadership, diplomacy, and communication. He has been the captain of two frontline ships and in addition, his tours of duty have witnessed several important assignments, prestigious courses and interesting tenures at sea, ashore and abroad. He was also the defense advisor at the High Commission of India in Nairobi, Kenya from October 2008 to March 2012 with Kenya, Tanzania, Seychelles, Eritrea and Somalia as his area of responsibility. He has a PhD from Mumbai University, apart from five postgraduate degree in science and social sciences. He has been senior faculty in Navy, military colleges and training institutions. 
He has also been the lead writer and chief editor of nine books and many journals for the Indian Navy. In addition, he has been involved with several academic, creative and corporate outreach uh, endeavors of the Navy. He's currently the director of Maritime Warfare Center, Mumbai, as also the officer in charge of Naval History Project. He has been conferred the Vishishta Seva Medal, VSM, in the Republic Day Awards this year. So congratulations, Commodore Kaysnur. And with that, I request, I'm sorry for the interruption in between because there was a audio disturbance. Uh, I, I hand over the floor to Commodore Kaysnur. Over to you, Commodore Kaysnur. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Anuradha. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, at the very outset, I'd like to thank Professor Anuradha for her very generous introduction and most importantly, congratulate her as the director in charge of CMAS uh, for the event today. If I were to use naval parlance and compare the inauguration to the commissioning of the ship, then today, your project is underway and hopefully with some more things happening over the next few days and then when the admissions commence you would be making way so this is a very very important day today for you and i would like to offer my heartiest congratulations to the vice chancellor whose dream project this has been to all the faculty members of mumbai university to you and all those who work with you, to the advisory board, to the board of studies members, and everyone who has been a part of this uh, initiative. So congratulations once again. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, before I begin uh, as a moderator, I'd like to offer a caveat. Uh, the caveat is this, that I'm aware that today's audience consists at one end of certain experts, eminent experts, esteemedly senior, Navy officers, merchant Navy officers, academic scholars. On the other hand, there are young students, young officers, young people keen to know about maritime history, citizens who want to know much more about our maritime canvas. So it's my job as a moderator to sort of align uh, the, the heterogeneous audience to one common framework. Therefore, I seek the indulgence of the more uh, senior, the more esteemed members uh, when I talk, that if some things seem very obvious to you, uh, kindly indulge me in that regard. So, ladies and gentlemen, we have with us, as uh, Professor Anuradha brought out, a very esteemed resource person, Admiral Sanjay Singh. I will be talking about him in a bit. Uh, but before that, I thought, let me briefly set the stage for the subject that he's going to be talking about, India's Maritime Strategic Imperatives. Now, it might be very obvious, it might be a truism to say that India is a maritime nation. Our geography, which bestows on us many blessings, two coasts, huge coastline, a vast EEZ, numerous islands, our history, which goes back to 5,000 years of seafaring, a glorious heritage, and the recent, comparatively recent denouement of colonization when we turned our backs to the seas. It's very evident in the way that sea impacted us one way or the other over the 5,000 years. Our more recent concerns, be it terrorism and security, be it economy with more than 90% of our trade coming through the seas, be it energy security, all of this in some ways is dependent on the seas or is impacted by the sea. Therefore, we are indeed a maritime nation. Now, having said that, there seems to be some sort of uh, 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 dilemma about this, that we who are in the maritime world know this and realize this, but does the rest of our country, do the rest of our countrymen, do other thinkers, uh, does the political and bureaucratic epics realize this? Now, that is why constantly you hear in the maritime circles, a phrase called sea blindness, wherein we think or assume or perceive that the people who don't belong to maritime community don't understand enough about us or don't understand enough about the importance of this domain. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is 
this is interesting and like all other assertions it's not necessarily completely true there are lots of thinkers and scholars political leaders who have been talking about the importance of seas right from the independence but important part is we feel so and we feel that there is a need for greater maritime consciousness in our country now what has happened is that the maritime world itself consists of so many players and actors that they often seem to operate in their own silos a uh, fisherman probably does not know what happens on board uh, a rig uh, which tends to our offshore security needs that person may not know what the person uh, in a tanker or a container carrier is bringing from somewhere that person who is on a container carrier may not know much what a lighthouse authority person is doing those people in lighthouse authority may not appreciate what navy means when we say blue water operations so there are these silos in which we continue to operate now having said that it needs just some trigger something for example the piracy that happened of gulf of eden uh, about a decade ago and still simmers sometimes or even the more recent cyclone tote that happened off mumbai for us to realize that the maritime world is one we are in it all together uh, we swim or sink together so if the maritime world is one then it axiomatically follows that the maritime world particularly in india ought to speak in one voice now ought to speak in one voice doesn't mean a sort of uh, a trade union template of demands but it means more are we speaking the same language are we voicing the same sort of ideas uh, are we thinking of the same interests about the maritime domain now uh, in india over the last two decades uh, one of the more interesting developments that has happened is that the indian navy has taken a lead in articulating a set of concerns that completely talk about the maritime domain one way or the other the indian navy realizing the interconnectedness of the maritime world has sought to bring a series of documents has sought to be in some ways the thought leader with regard to espousing a whole lot of issues that pertain to the maritime ecosystem now ladies and gentlemen arguably the indian navy having risen from a small force of less than half a sloops to to a sort of one of the most formidable navies in the world arguably plays the role of a sachin tendulkar or virat kohli it does the heavy lifting uh, in india's maritime spectrum with other aspects of our maritime power still a work in progress therefore as the principal uh, instrument of the nation's sovereignty in the maritime realm the navy has been uh, a thought leader a knowledge leader Uh, some years ago there was a document called non alignment 2.0 which said that a country really progresses when you start producing your own knowledge and in that regard i think the navy has taken a lead it's always been so but in the last two decades this has been particularly pronounced in taking a lead in this regard and has brought out a series of documents uh, which talk about the maritime world and that stems from what Uh, is today's topic strategic imperatives which themselves flow from our policy which is influenced by our uh, objectives and which in turn is driven by what can be called our maritime interest so our maritime interest if i uh, i i take it that uh, admiral sanjay singh who's been deeply a part and i'll come to that in a minute part of many of these cogitation exercises and bringing out these documents uh, much of his talk today would be about all those thought processes when he brought out those documents uh, as he sees it uh, india strategic maritime strategic imperatives are a subset of india's maritime geography india's maritime economy and india's maritime security and i will uh, uh, you know be inviting him to talk about that in a bit but now let's come on to our speaker and allow me again to delve in a little bit not so much for giving a vast bio data but just to tell you how much apt and appropriate he is for this subject so uh, just the bare bones skeleton framework is impressive enough 
He was uh, he's a product of NDA, where he passed out as the best naval cadet in uh, June 1985. Subsequently, he was the best afloat cadet, winning the binoculars. He won the telescope uh, on commissioning uh, as the best uh, uh, officer cadet. Thereafter, he went on to do long uh, navigation and direction, specialized in that, where he topped the course again. Then he did his staff college subsequently, a few years later in UK, where in an international course, he came first again. And that's been you know, a sort of rhythm with him where he aces and tops all the courses that he attends. He is, like I said, a navigation specialist. He has done tenures on frontline fleet ship, and he has commanded a multi-purpose uh, frigate, the INS Trishul, guided missile frigate, and before that, a UAV control ship and ASW frigate, the INS Taragiri. The acme of his commands, of course, was the Western Fleet uh, from 2019 to 2020. At a particularly volatile time with regard to security in our neighborhood, uh, the command of the Western Fleet, ladies and gentlemen, is arguably the most tough two-star assignment that anyone in the Navy can have. And now he's the controller of personal services, looking after a range of issues uh, uh, you know, that, that matter to the Navy's personnel. Now, this is just the skeletal framework. If I were to fill some flesh and blood into it, uh, you would see that he brings specialization in a range of verticals. If you talk of diplomacy, he has done that through a tenure as Naval Attaché in Tehran and through a course in UK. If you talk of training and professional military education, he has been the head of our navigation school, navigation direction school. He has headed the local workup team in Mumbai. Subsequently, he was the flag officer C training. And like some of you have heard, he was the commandant of the Naval War College. If you take human resource development, he spent a tenure in the personal directorate uh, as a commander and now has come back as the controller of personal services. Operations, he has been in the forefront of operations wherein having commanded ships and done frontline fleet appointments, he was the principal director of naval operations in naval headquarters at Delhi. And then he went on to become the assistant chief of naval staff in charge of network-centric operations for the Indian Navy before, of course, commanding the fleet. Uh, he has been in the forefront of conceptualizing doctrines and strategy through a tenure as principal director of our strategy, concepts, and transformation. And he has been the lead writer and lead drafter, ladies and gentlemen, of Indian Navy's maritime doctrine that came out in 2008, Indian Navy's maritime security strategy that came out in 2015, and Indian Navy's guidance for transformation that also came out in 2015. He's been conferred, as you heard, the Nausena Medal and the Athivishis Seva Medal for his distinguished services to the nation. But having said all of this, I would just like to add one final word or sentence. Ladies and gentlemen, over the years, uh, the flag officer has been renowned for being one of our most articulate thinkers, one of uh, a leading scholar warriors. Whenever he has been there at public forums or he has spoken to people, he has voiced navies and maritime uh, words, uh, imperatives, concerns, thought processes, in a manner that only he can, he brings to the table, not just vast experience, but also vast scholarship. And for students in the education world, you would be happy to know that he has a MA in history from Mumbai University, a MSc in defense and strategic studies from Chennai, from Madras University. He's a MA in defense studies from King's College London. He's an MPhil from the Madras University. He's an MPhil from uh, Mumbai University. And he topped that all with a PhD from Mumbai University. So as you can see, he's not just a scholar, warrior, academic. He's uh, everything rolled into one with deep connections with the University of Mumbai. I think with that introduction, uh, just last 30 seconds on some house rules, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Admiral S.J. Singh will be speaking for about an hour. That will give us good 35, 40 minutes for question answers, interaction, and he'll take them all. Kindly type them in the chat box so that I or Professor Anuradha can see 
and then take on questions. Sometimes if they are similar, we'll take them together one. Of course, if there is a possibility, we we'll, uh, request you to unmute uh, your video and audio and speak to him directly. In case there are friends from the media, I would like to generally very, very, uh, um, you know, sort of uh, 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 tell them in a very gentle manner, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is an academic interaction where our speaker is speaking in an academic forum with some degree of conviviality. If you are reporting on this event, kindly get back to us so that you get the correct perspective and do follow Chatham House rules in this regard. So with that, uh, Admiral S.J. Singh, may I request you to sort of take the stage and uh, set the proceedings rolling. Thank you, Congress Shikan. Uh, I was wondering whether you can put me under any more pressure than you have today. And you've done a marvelous job of putting me on the back foot entirely, considering that the audience I've got from Captain Arasu, who was my instructor when I was a midshipman, right up to a former chief, to the former chief of personnel, and many other gurus. And uh, by adding on all those lists, I suspect that in the evening I might have to offer a few beers to recover the last 35 years of misdeeds. But uh, thanks a lot, and no thanks for putting the pressure on me. Uh, Dr. Radha, Director CMAS, on the case to monitor for the session. Uh, eminences, former instructors, colleagues, and most importantly, fellow students. We never stop learning, and I half suspect after what Shikhan has told me. I, I was just thinking, uh, do I have anything to do with all this or do I also have to sit down and start learning a lot of it? I suspect I'm going to be learning a lot this evening. Uh, getting on to the aspects, uh, we have had a fairly comprehensive introduction to the subject. Both Dr. Radha and Amro Srikant have covered it. Let me get to the meat. I propose to hit the high spots, what we often call a windshield tour or a whistle stop tour, hitting the high points and going across various issues as he's brought out in our very wonderful and long history, it's always been the seas that have ensured the prosperity of the nation. It is when we looked away from the cultural links, the trade links, the financial links, and started looking closer and closer towards our shores that the enemy kept coming closer and closer. And as we almost entirely started concentrating on the battles on the land frontier and the struggles on the land borders and ignored the seas, that is exactly the time that the seas from being our strongest source of strength became our underbelly and our vulnerability and led to the loss of our trade, our finance, our industrialization, our sovereignty. Today, as we about to enter the 75th year of our independence, as we start resurging once again, we start getting to the fourth industrial age, the seas have become more important than ever. And that is exactly what I intend and propose to concentrate on as we move forward, broadly touching upon the following aspects, as you said, geography, economy, and a little bit about the security challenges. You're familiar with the outlook of the Indian Ocean. We sit astride it, large amount of sea lanes, which constitute sea lines of communication in times of conflict and confrontation, a massive coastline, which has been recently recalculated at 11,000 plus kilometers, after we have gone in and re-looked as per the UNCLOS into the definition of islands, what all should constitute a coastline if the island numbers have got upgraded to 1982 now. And we cannot do better than start off with recalling Sadar K. M. Panikar, who has kept emphasizing the basic geographical nature of the Indian Ocean and India's position astride those. We have 80% of the traffic traversing through the Indian Ocean region is extra about 120,000 ships transited, out of which 70,000 are through Malacca. We have one quarter of the world population. We have two thirds of the world's oil shipments and 50% of the container shipments through the street. It is for this precise reason that you have about, at any given time, close to 120 warships from about 15 extra regional navies. We are not talking about those who we would classify as Indian Ocean navies. 15 extra regional navies at any given time have 120 warships here. Closer home, we are aware that we have more than 2 million square kilometers of our exclusive economic zone. And as soon as the continent shelf delineation is done, we expect us to reach at par with our landmass. That's 3.2 million square kilometers. We have exclusive rights for deep seabed mining about 5,000 kilometers south of Delhi. 
That's about 1,200 nautical miles from Kanyakumari, which we have, you would have read the papers recently, we launched a deep uh, resources mission, and that's going to start analyzing all the deep seabed mining and the data, and looking at ways and means that you can extract and utilize these very strategic and rare resources. While on the maritime front, we can claim that we have boundaries with everybody, because that is the nature of uh, the maritime domain. But with immediate neighbors, we have seven people, seven countries with whom we have immediate boundaries. And we have settled with six of them already, all with the principles of international law. We have always been adhering to international law, believing in a rules-based order to say that, look, this finally has to be a win-win situation for everyone. And that needs a common set of rules, a common set of laws to which everybody gives equal mutual respect. Quick one, there's been some discussion at various stages of maritime boundaries. A quick, quick recollection. Uh, we have the coastline. Where the coastline is heavily indented, it can be made and straightened up into a straight baseline. Your territorial waters, or internationally we call them territorial seas, is 12 miles from the baseline, and you have another 12 miles of a contiguous zone for fiscal and customs requirements. And then from, from the straight baseline, you count 400 nautical miles for exclusive economic zone. And obviously, as you interpret the law, you will interpret it in a manner that the law permits and which is favorable to you. For example, in the Gulf of Kutch, one interpretation could have been very restrictive and not in the normal trend of what is done, that is very close to the coast. The other, as per international law, it is permitted to grade the Gulf of Kutch as international waters, internal waters, that is exactly what we have done. And based on that, we have promulgated our straight baselines in accordance with law in May 2009. One section of it is still to be done, and that should get done shortly. Yes, we have had certain differences of view with maritime neighbors and friends, uh, which have been settled in accordance with law, in accordance with negotiations, in the correct spirit. And if you see, we have, other than one neighbor, where also bulk of the issues could be settled on a technical point to separate subjects. Uh, we have, by the principles of international law, settled our maritime boundaries all across. Looking at our ports, which are actually our gateway for trade, gateway to the outside world, uh, we have 12 major ports and 200 non-major ports in the country. These are set to grow, as we'll discuss a little later. We are responsible for a very vast navigation area. It's, we have only five in the Indian Ocean region. What we are responsible for is India is the largest, where all navigation warnings all coordination is being carried out by us. We also have a very large search and rescue region in which the Coast Guard is the national SAR agency is the lead, which is supported by the Navy and the Air Force on as required basis, depending on the scale of events that may occur. We have to concentrate on the vast shipping. Remember I said 80% of the shipping in the Indian Ocean region is actually extra resource. We have 92,500 ships worldwide. We have 15 lakh fishing vessels worldwide. Two and a half lakh of those are just our own. At any given time, we'll have about 5,000 ships in the Indian Ocean region. By and large, the IR is benign, but no seas can remain benign unless you keep a watchful eye and you maintain your domain awareness over them. Shifting a bit now from the geography to the economy, I look at it under the headings that I've seen, uh, security, shipping, trade, and fishing. We've been talking about energy security for a long period of time, but the basic truth remains that our needs for energy have kept rising. What we have been producing on the domestic circuit has almost been stable over the last two decades. That's about 33 MMT per year. But our energy needs have grown phenomenal. Today we have close to 96% of our dependence is on the seas for our oil needs. And I'll come to that as to why do we look at this particular figure in this manner. And our imports is about 80 per, 88 percent is of crude oil. Our offshore domestic production is also part of our dependence on the seas. We have about 48 to 49 percent of our domestic production is offshore, and almost 80 percent of the natural gas production is offshore. And you look at the overall oil demand over the last two decades, you see the growth that has taken place, and you look at this figure and you see it from two angles. One. You look at the almost static domestic production that is taking place. As I said, 32, 33 million metric tons per annum. 50% of that, they would take a couple of MMT. It's been offshore. The rest is onshore. At the same time, whatever we are importing, we are also exporting almost 25% of that. 
because we have invested hugely in refineries. So while we may take improved products, we are exporting finished products thereafter, which are also adding to our trade. So you see the growth of the total oil demand that we have had. In just the last two decades, it is almost tripled. While our own domestic production has remained static, and that is something to be borne in mind. That is why I say that we are hitting 96% of our total oil demand is dependent upon the seas directly and indirectly. So whatever we do, the seas around us will influence, will control our prosperity, our growth. This is summed up what I just mentioned, that by and large, our dependence is being rising at about half to 1% per year over the last 20 years. We are at a peak where it really can't change much. And in the foreseeable future, we don't see it going down anywhere less than 95%. So 95% of plus of our dependence on the seas for our energy, for our oil, for our well-being. Okay. And from where are most of our imports coming? While we have been diversifying our sources of import across the world, you'll see that we are also importing hugely now from Africa as well as North and South America. Yet the core of it still remains the Persian Gulf because the amount that we exporting has increased so much. It has varied between 60 to 65 percent over the last two to three decades. And it has remained within that in the foreseeable future. I don't see it coming down below 55 percent at, at any point. Looking at our shipping industry, have we been increasing and enhancing our shipping industry? Of course we have. While there have been some laments to say that shipping industry is not growing, that's not entirely accurate from a technical point of view. It has been growing. In fact, over the last five to seven years, it's actually been growing faster than the global rate. But it cannot and has not been able to keep pace with the growth of our exemplary. Our total amount of imports and exports have been rising at a far higher rate than any shipping growth that can ever occur, certainly in the foreseeable future. So today we are at a situation where we have between 92 to 95 percent of our entire trade is born on foreign shipping. In just four decades, we have gone from 40% to 92 plus percent. And is this going to change? No, not likely. Because no matter how much we enhance, and we have been expanding, as I said, the rate of growth of our shipping industry in India and the Sagar Mola project, which we'll come to a little later, has been at a faster rate than global growth. Yet the rate of growth of our economy, of our domestic demands, of our requirements for uh, energy and trade is multiple times that of the platforms in which we carry it out. So in the foreseeable future, whatever we do, our dependence on foreign ships will remain. So if our dependence on foreign ships will remain, then the security of the sea lanes on which those foreign ships travel is essential for us to ensure. So the safety and security of foreign merchant shipping blind the international sea routes is our national interest for India because we are heavily dependent upon those foreign ships and those shipping lanes. Hence, every time when you read and you see the Indian Navy is moving out, I mean, we are trying to enhance the maritime security in the region. It is not for anybody else, more so maximum, it is for our own safety and security. All right. Moving on, global growth, as I mentioned, has been at a rate of about two and a half percent, give or take a little bit, while ours has been upwards of four percent. The shipbuilding industries in the Far East have reached a state of dominance that it will take decades to be able to balance. China alone has got 40 percent global shipbuilding share, while Japan and Korea, between themselves, are handling another 50 percent. That's again something that's not going to change in the near future. So we are going to be dependent upon foreign shipping. While we will keep enhancing our shipbuilding industry, and that's something to be borne in mind when we focus on our interests and our strategy, the global port mean turnaround time is 23 and a half hours. And I'll come to this, this particular point a little later when we see what efforts have taken place to try and enhance our own. Okay. World seafarers, another very interesting bit of data. Two decades ago, we were providing between less than 5% of the world's seafarers. A decade ago, it was about 6 to 7%. Five years ago, it was about 6.5%. Today, 
we are providing more than 14% of the world's seafarers. When you talk of escorting merchant shipping through piracy infested areas, you find the majority of those, even if they're foreign flag vessels, have Indian crew. So while the Navy has carried out now escorts for since two, October 2008 in the Gulf of Aden, and we have escorted upwards of 3,500 ships, the vast majority of the 25,000 seafarers on those, on those ships have been Indian. And when you look at the trend of growth of India moving into the global seafaring industry, it is growing at an annual rate of more than 4%. Okay. Looking at our trade, and I'm looking at this only as regions, regions which remain important to us from export and import, because those regions will define, as I said, 90 to 95% of our trade is seaborne. So the region with which we have the maximum trade, those sea routes become vital for us. And if you look at it, just almost all across the world, all across the Indian Ocean region, all across the extended and Indo-Pacific region from the Persian Gulf to the United States, ASEAN, China, Far East Asia, majority of our trade is across these routes and these regions. When you look at the total cargo, now while the figure of financial that you find right at the top may seem as if it's dipped in between, that is only because the price of oil had dipped. If you look at the scale of cargo, it has been increasing at more than 4% per year, steady over the last one decade. That's the amount of trade that we are getting into our ports and what we are exporting on an annual basis. What are we doing about it? Well, we have those 12 major ports, 200 non-major ports. Your cargo carrying capacity has been increasing tremendously over the last uh, decade plus. Our container growth has been higher than the global rate. Our seaborne trade has been growing higher than the global rate, but is it enough? Certainly not, because as I mentioned, unless our sea trade keeps incre increasing, unless our exports keep increasing, unless the sea routes and our ability to export becomes faster and cheaper, our dependence and our growth will always get, dependence will remain high, the growth will remain limited. Okay. So you have a huge project called Sagarwala enunciated more than two decades ago, revitalized over the last decade, in which it's looked at a holistic manner. We looked at port modernization, connecting the ports, the industries that are feeding the ports, as well as processing the non-major ports, fishing, uh, and the overall trade around those regions. Okay. What have we done about it? Now, there will be, and there have been concerns to say that pace of progress, the rate of growth has not been as much as you would have wished it to be. That's very new, isn't it? It always will be less. Even the window for the Sagar Mala project is 20 years. Over the last five years, since we started putting money into the project and pushing it, what have we achieved? Is there any mean achievement in what we've got across over here? It's a phenomenal amount if you look at it. Almost about one third of the sanctioned money plus it started flowing. Your cargo carrying capacity at all your ports has been increasing exponentially. Yes, while we may want it to have reached a very high peak by 2025, probably it'll take a few more years to do that. New merger ports have been identified. The, the techno-economical uh, search have been carried out. The approval and principle has been given for at least two or three more of them to get set up. So what do we see as we go along? We see that we're going to be having increased ports. We have been having increased cargo. There has been year on year increase that has been taking place in the amount of cargo we handle. The turnaround time that we used to have, which was four days a decade ago, has come down by 40% already. In some parts and portions of that, we are at global averages. Some others, we are slow, and that both modernization that are taking place over the next coming years, we will find a major change taking place. It is part and parcel of not just the primary Sagarmala project, but the associated aspects that we have been seeing, as I mentioned, growth of shipping, growth of seafarers, growth of fishing industry, which I'll come to, as well as coastal shipping and the trade. So what does that mean for us? It means that we are going to be having increasingly busy waters around India, not just in our EZ or in our territorial waters, but also in the broader neighborhood. On that traffic, will rely our safety, our security, and our growth. And that is something we've got to remember. If there's one thing that I request you to pick away from all this data, is this one line. The seas around us are getting more congested. They're getting busier. 
our dependence on the seas is increasing the safety and security of the sea lanes all around the indian ocean region is of vital national interest for us okay quick look at fishing we will be morning the fishing industry is not been growing but actually it has been growing a bit in the world average once again a huge growth of almost 8% per year most of this unfortunately and i I'll qualify unfortunately only been with indian fishing where we have been able to tremendously expand the capacity for fishing but marine fishing we still have are less than 70% of where we need to be so there is a huge amount that we need to enhance expand the fishing techniques expand the kind of fishing vessels support them in regulations also for aspects of security and there's a huge fishing industry out there which is dependent upon it and which which is contributing a tremendous amount back to the national economy okay now shifting aside when we keep talking about engaging the countries outside foreign direct investment the amount of indians that we have our cultural links that exist over there is not only to be seen in purely diplomatic or cultural terms but also in hard financial terms hard political terms 3% of our gdp which is more than the defense budget mind you is just the repatriation from the indian diaspora abroad direct terms the money they are sending home to support families at home is more than the indian defense budget keep that up in the mind and then you start looking at indirect that is the foreign direct investment in which the indian diaspora is involved you look at the various indian investment projects that have been taking place all across the world we have more than 50 50 sites all across the world in more than a quarter century countries so about 27 countries and 53 projects just hydrocarbon projects where we've got dominance and controlled by indian money where the indian companies have been invested and that again is playing plowed back into our energy security into our finances and where exactly are these people where are they i feel that you look at them as nris that is the indian citizens as indian citizens you have obligations towards them just as they have, they have got strong links and legal control and and links with india you suddenly find that a vast majority of them are right there in the position of no surprises why is it that the gulf and the entire gulf region is so important to us not just the energy but also just look at the number of indians who are there and these indians in the gulf are responsible for 50% of the remittances that i mentioned to you just a little while ago that's about 1.5% of gdp is coming back just from these indians who are working there in the gulf region and then in expanded to say people who are of indian origin overseas citizens of india where are they spread all across the asean and america they are, they have most of them done extremely well for themselves those cultural links which have got translated into economic links once again constitute a major national interest for us and the linkage over there once again if any of that kind of trade that will occur is going to be from the seas all right where does it come in in more direct terms sometimes to us With the growing uncertainties we had all the way from independence till the turn of the century we had only one one operation where we were stood to for what we call non combatant evacuation operation and that also didn't take place that was 1986 we didn't have to actually execute it but in the last 15 years we have done at least four such operations so there is rising uncertainty there is a reach back there is an expectation and there is an obligation and all of that is primarily being filled from the seas whether it is operation rahat or it is operation samudra sea okay now looking at maritime security and the challenges this is as would be expected a vast vast subject by itself and we can delve into some of it in the in the discussion that you and i uh, suffice at this particular stage i just want to flag some of the major points and not get into the details uh, of this you look at traditional challenges the regional security environment can at best be described as fluid it's dynamic it's changing all the time demanding a constant watch a constant endeavor to draw the passage plan of the graph which way it's heading and trying to hedge our bets because the most dangerous may not be the most likely threat and you have to cater for the entire range to the most dangerous to the most likely so security environment remains fluid it could be from a low intensity to a high intensity conflict it could be from benign or constabulary role to high end military operations all of it very very rapidly compressed in time and in space 
In this, the region closest to us, which is arguably amongst the most uh, of strategic interest to us when you talk of the West Asian region, as we discussed, not just from energy security point of view, but also simply the largest amount of Indians who are working over there and what they're sending back home, but also because this is the region which constitutes two of the big choke points from where the bulk of India's trade. Here is where I will distinguish between the sea lanes and sea lines of communication. The sea lanes passing through the Babal Mandev and the Strait of Hormuz constitute sea lines of communication for India because there is really no alternative lines that we have. We are dependent upon these sea lanes as from peace to uncertain situations to potentially hostile scenarios in which our trade, our ships need to keep coming through. In this, you have at the global level, you have the world moving from it's unipolar to bipolar to multipolar to perhaps back to bipolar. And in that, there is a larger amount of churn and engagement that is taking place, which beautifully uh, categorizes Sagar Manthan uh, by, by eminent uh, analysts like Mr. Rajamohan. And you also got the inklings of a quad 2.0 moving across. Now, in this, this is an evolving scenario in which, once again, which is the theater, which is the dimension, which is central to all of that. The maritime one. You have a rising China looking towards overcoming its uh, so called century of humiliation, looking out as a major outreach over the last 15 years from the time it first entered tentatively after many centuries into the Indian Ocean. Today it is all across the Indian Ocean. It has a major strategic presence, and we have close to all, going to be almost 50 task forces from China in a couple of years from now, the 48th is, is already present over here, and we'll, we'll soon see a half century of the task forces present on a permanent basis in the Indian Ocean. And then, of course, we have Pakistan, let's say the better than saying it represents a continued danger both to itself and to everybody else around. Looking at the defense budget, well, we know where we are. We're facing very challenging times. We, we want to keep balancing out and perhaps hedging various issues. But in the meanwhile, our northern neighbor is just galloping with his defense budget, which was for one and a half times ours two decades ago, is gone upwards of three and a half times already to the declared part by international sources. And official sources indicate it's five times as much as we are spending. Now, in a decade, China is producing two Indian navies. They've been producing at the rate of 10 major frigates and destroyers per year over the last 10 years now. That constitutes a major consideration, whichever way you may look at it, is a factor that has to be taken into account when, and their increasing presence in the Indian Ocean is something that all the planners, the strategic planners and the naval strategists will have to keep bearing in mind at all times. On the maritime front also there has been a major outreach. We have been speaking about Blue East, Certainly, the look east was enabled by the maritime look east, or the maritime outreach. And that has been beautifully encapsulated, what I'll say, the one-line vision, the saga. It just covers it in just one phrase, security and growth for all of the region. It encompasses the national perspective, the national doctrine, the national strategy all rolled into one. Inclusive growth, engage with everybody, mutual security, equal security, cooperative security. So that there is mutual growth, inclusive growth, underpinned by a common rules-based order so that there is no misunderstanding. We understand each other because there is a common underpinning of laws and rules that all have, it, all have agreed to. We only need to adhere to them, both in letter and spell. There's been a steady push now towards multilateralism. The days when we were looking at only singular one point, one on one have gone past. Today, the world is interconnected. IT is interconnected. We are interconnected right now as we are speaking all across the country. Well, so is our maritime outreach interconnected in exactly the same manner. It is as if you can consider that in the, in the Indian Ocean, we represent a hub and the spoke is all around. And we're working with both the hub and spoke as well as the wheel and rim because what is going around is coming around to us. So if you're investing in maritime security or a maritime outreach or a maritime engagement in one area, it's getting passed all the way around and circling around and coming back to us. So we're operating towards both. And as, and as I said, the underpinning of all this remains the accepted international rules and international laws. Right. 
non tradition challenges this is a subject by itself which we we'll carry on for a separate hour but i'd be happy to discuss some of it if you would like to take up some parts of it uh, terrorism piracy evacuation hadr search and rescue terrorism really we looked upon the seas as a medium in issue a medium for which weapons would be brought inside this has been changing the nature has been changing to direct attacks from the sea and direct attacks at sea so it's no longer a passive conduit the seas have become active in this regard look at it three decades earlier it was just be used for bringing in explosives bringing in terrorists who carried out their mayhem it shifted to the terrorists directly on on launching an attack from the sea straight away and wreaking havoc contrary to all humanitarian norms all laws anyway the same thing is now being evinced at sea also the last two decades there been direct attacks on ships at sea you had merchant ships being struck all across the world but more so in the indian ocean region we've had attempts being made of hijacking warships by trained people and they hijack the warships and the warships traditionally you look upon them as a responsibility of the state but the state has no control and they carry out mayhem out at sea what does that do to the rules of engagement what does that do to the sense of security uh, all around fortunately they haven't yet succeeded but remains a risk you also have had attacks taking place directly from a shore onto ships at sea and it's been happening while it was bits and pieces 20 plus years back not as happening with increasing regularity over the last decade right just for the last couple of years we've seen increasing amount of conflict spilling out from a shore out onto the sea are we able to identify who who are the actors are the state actors acting incognito as special force are they non state actors we can't really be sure but what we can be sure is the seas need to be protected the ships need to be protected and there's the reason why the indian navy got deployed in operation sankalp in this particular region to try and ensure security for our shipping which is coming out from there over this period of time and remember this is very congested very congested maritime and air space which is there in the region so there is always a huge risk of somebody somewhere miscalculating something going wrong well it's now become a new normal which you have to keep tabs off because these are the issues as i mentioned the sea lanes through the persian gulf and the sea lanes to gulf of aden constitute sea lines of communication for us okay piracy we should read about them in books captain arasu will recollect uh, the books that he gave me as a midshipman to read starting with hms ulysses and midship and hornblower i thought piracy was all something which is there in the classic books didn't realize that in my own service life you would be actually seeing it facing it counting it it's been hugely growing off somalia it cost a huge amount 18 billion dollars a year to the world economy the high risk area initially thought of by the uh, the trade industries themselves without any discussion reached all across to the shores of india and i'll come to that countering it we have faced basic problems of law whose jurisdiction is it what should be the rules of engagement how do international agencies cooperate and use the word agencies it's not just sovereign agencies but also merchant agencies what also ships which are owned by one country in one country flag of a second country cargo of a third country finances of a fourth country crews of a fifth country and some of these changing hands while they're on route what about the armed personnel and weapons rules and regulations for those and how much can you combat at sea because the problem remains ashore well there have been many endeavors made un has been active but primarily the bulk of the work has had to come from military coordination we looked at the legal issue we looked at the information we looked at supporting the merchant shipping and, and enhancing the coordination between merchant ships and navies but primarily it has fallen down to the militaries themselves the navies themselves getting together on a voluntary basis under the broader ambit of the united nations and working out ways and means which you can combat it certainly there have been organizations created for looking at policy matters both under the un as well as separate they have achieved a lot and what have we done with this we have been providing a push back what i call the furthest line of piracy and that particular slide i don't have here but broadly i'll tell you if you look at this the high risk area had at one stage reached within the ease of india 
A solid operation was launched, sustained over several years by the Indian Navy and the Indian Coast Guard combined. And we pushed back the furthest line of piracy, which had reached the Indian EZ, right back all across the Arabian Sea into the Gulf of Aden back again. We were robust at this, and the Indian Navy's efforts and India's efforts at redefining the high risk area, which has led progressively every five years, to its being pushed back. Today, is the 2018 line valid? Perhaps not. Perhaps it can go in a little further. Can we afford to take our eyes off now that there have been no major piracy incidents? Certainly not. Is this a new normal? Possibly. Possibly. We have done 10 plus years continuous operations in that region. We also have had two, two plus years now of operations in the other choke point. And is this going to change? No, because our dependence on the sea routes, our dependence on the sea lanes, criticality of the sea lines of communication passing through the bubble Monday with the state of Hormuz are not going to change, not in the possible future. In the meanwhile, what about the merchant ships themselves? Can't they protect themselves? Surely. They have. They found solutions to privately, uh, private guards, contracted guards, and maritime secure companies. But that also constitutes part of the problem. Who's regulating these companies? Where are they registered? What about the people? A company may be registered in country A. Weapons are coming from country B. The guards are coming from country C. Embarked on ships belonging, as I said, multiple four other countries involved. Who has jurisdiction over these guards? And they get passed within 12 miles of the Indian coast or any other coast. That's striking distance in case they're in the hands of the wrong person. What about even legitimate people? What about scope for genuine errors? What about scope for incompetence? What happens to the lives and livelihood of other people at sea? Their safety and security. Well, all of this demands a greater engagement with the laws, the regulations, the traffic, maritime domain awareness, and sheer presence of maritime forces, both the Navy as well as the Coast Guard, not just of one country, because there's no one country, no one maritime force can do it in a cooperative framework. You're getting somewhere where what I'm pointing out that whatever we do, we will need to have a huge amount of regional coordination, if not cooperation. Now, if you look at non combatant evacuation operations, when you look at humanitarian assistance, the relief uh, challenges, we look at search and rescue. The instances of these happening over the last decade to two decades has been rising very, very steadily. It's not going away. Every time we hope that now there won't be an extreme event of one kind or the other. And lo and behold, a couple of years later, it happened once again. As I said, we have to keep focusing and being ready for the most dangerous threat. Yet we have to have the ability to respond swiftly and efficiently the most likely threats. So the range of threats from traditional to non-traditional will remain out over there because our dependence on the seas will remain as high as ever. So our engagement with the seas cannot afford to reduce. This broadly is where we are. So when we look at, say, what is India's areas of maritime interest? Well, it's a mix of all the factors of dependence and what is it that we can reach out to, what we can aspire to. And hence, we've defined this in two areas, primary and secondary. It's not to say there is any area, maritime area in the world, which is not of interest to us. It is. But the primary areas have been expanding slowly. And today, they are represented in the slightly darker blue shade that you see all through up to the Red Sea and the Suez on one side and the Persian Gulf on the other, down to the Cape of Good Hope and all across to the Lombok and uh, just short of Mumbai Vita Strait, all the way across uh, onto the other side touching the Indo-Pacific, which also constitutes the secondary area of interest for us. We have investments, engagements, cooperation, and needs. In our vast network, as I said, look upon your IT network, look upon the way we are sitting and speaking today from all over uh, the country, all over the world. The same network exists out at sea. The maritime network is a physical network as much as the virtual network on which we are communicating today. And that network also has its rules. That network also needs its abilities, its strengths. And that exactly is when we say, if you ask me in a nutshell, what are India's core maritime interests? Well, I put them up over here for you. We have to protect our sovereignty, territorial integrity, certainly. Citizens, trade, energy supply routes, assets, all in the maritime domain. Maintaining a benign, a favorable and positive maritime environment, 
across the areas of primary and secondary maritime interest in the most benign, inclusive ways, but being ready for being able to protect our national interest against all threats. So we have listed out the set of maritime security objectives vis-a-vis -vis the interest, and then defined for each of these security objectives, we have a strategy. The maritime strategy and the discussion on that is perhaps a separate talk. Uh, in case uh, Shikant and Captain are also give me a give me a pass today, I may be able to take a mulligan and come back and discuss those on another occasion. So let me at this stage take a pause and and move into discussion by saying we have as India as the Indian Navy as Indian maritime outlook a need to redevelop our consciousness of our dependence on the seas of the intricate linkage of India's growth, India's security. At one stage, India's sovereignty, it sounds like a phrase, but we've seen it being lost to the seas just a few decades, a few, a few centuries ago. All of this, we need to keep developing our thinking, our doctrines, our concepts, and then our ability. And then what are we going to do with that? So there's a, there's a constant movement of what can we do? What do we need to do? How do we go about doing it? With that, from location Dr. Anuradha, I'll take a short pause and tell you that we are trying on a constant and daily basis, at least when I say we here, I'm not specifically talking of the Indian Navy, is being deployed on a daily basis all across the region in trying to bolster, strengthen the maritime security and sustain and pro promote and project India's maritime interests. With that, I'll take a pause. Catch my breath, if I may, and uh, Commodore Kesto, back to you for discussion. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Admiral S.J. Singh. Uh, I think that was, that was fascinating. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, when you listen to Admiral S.J. Singh anytime, uh, you can be sure of uh, being shocked and awed the the shock and awe comes through uh, in in the huge amount of uh, data knowledge information uh, that is packed and given so as you can see it was so rich with information that even if you paused briefly you might have missed out on something that was to follow so so that's that's i think been a wonderful talk and the fact that he has actually uh, taken a pause a little before what I thought he would uh, gives us that much more time for question answers. So, so uh, we uh, uh, for interaction, and I'd like to I think um, congratulate all the participants. As I can see, there are 240. I mean that is huge. That is huge. Uh, so, so we uh, what I would do, like I said, uh, you know, there are various. I mean he moved across a vast canvas in terms of our geography, security, economy, and there are a wide uh, range of questions there. So let me let me uh, sort of begin with some questions that have come. I'll take some of them and I'll try and see uh, as I go through the chat box to ask uh, others, some of them to ask directly, others to... Now, um, uh, Sanjay, the first set of questions relate to some bit about energy. Uh, there's Nilima Prabhu who is asking if nuclear energy can be an alternative and what are the pros and cons in that in terms of uh, therefore then what sort of damage control but would it be a good uh, environmental uh, alternative and that is supplanted by another question from Neha who asks what are the fuel alternatives that we are dealing with in uh, in the Navy. Uh, Neha has another question on piracy. I'll come back to that later. But you could uh, start off with this, and, and I'll, I'll uh, come come to more questions that have been asked. Right, thank you. Thank you for that, Shikant. Nuclear energy. Absolutely very interesting. You look at it, there is no doubt that nuclear energy and peaceful use of nuclear energy is something that we have been pursuing very actively now for five decades. We have been trying to enhance the nuclear energy components across the country. But realistically speaking, our energy demands, the rate at which they've been growing, no matter how much you accelerate and expand your nuclear energy program, it will continue to remain somewhere close to 10 to 
of your total energy needs. Today, I think it's somewhere close to 5%. Somebody here may have more updated figures that, than I and could probably uh, contribute to that. But even if you expand it substantively and majorly as is the plan to do, your reliance on traditional energy is not going to fall. You will remain largely dependent upon coal, upon gas as your source of energy in the country for your growth. And that still constitutes even the near, today it's about 80% plus. You can bring in wind energy, you can bring in thermal energy, you can bring in hydroelectric energy, you can bring in solar energy. And all and the plans are there for each of these. But yet, your traditional energy at the rate at which your energy demands have been growing are not going to materially alter. Hence, your dependence on the seas. My, my whole linkage over here is not on the energy, but our dependence on the seas for meeting our energy needs are not going to substantively reduce. At the rate at which has been increasing, that's why I mentioned, I said upwards of 90%. Right now we are saying close 96% plus of our dependence for energy is on the seas vis-a-vis -vis hydrocarbon energies. But hydrocarbon as a source of energy in the country is not going to likely to drop anywhere below 80% in the near future. And even in, after a few decades, maybe up to three decades, it's not going to come below 60%. Now, that's my take. But I'm happy to be shown that it may not occur otherwise if somebody's got some other data. This is linked into the second question that she can't mention. What about other alternative sources of energy? Absolutely. We need to diversify our sources of energy. And there is a huge program for that. The country has been pursuing it for the last 20 years. We've been seeing the, the solar program in particular over the last uh, decade or so has galloped and expanded tremendously. So we're looking at adding solar energy. Hydroelectric is another source. We've been looking at adding on to hydro hydroelectric energy. We've even looking at tapping wind and tidal energy. So nothing to say that any of those source of energy should not be pursued. They need to be pursued. Bottom line is, how much of a difference is it going to make your overall dependence? As I said, you will remain anywhere between 80% plus to under the best of conditions, three decades from now, 60% plus we depend upon hydrocarbons. And those hydrocarbons that you're dependent upon are not available inside the country in the adequate measure. So you will remain dependent upon the seas for the foreseeable future. And when I say possible future, I'm talking about the next 30 to 50 years is a period I'm talking about. You cannot look away from the seas if you wish to have growth and development in the country because it is going to be energy driven and that energy is going to remain on and across the seas. Uh, if I missed out something that she can't, you can get back to me or we can get back to the original uh, the participants who had a point on this. Yes, certainly. And, and questions are just sort of flowing in. You know, they're, they're actually flowing at a rate faster than you spoke. So, so it tells you how interesting the talk has been. Now, uh, uh, you mentioned a very interesting statistic. You said in a decade, China is producing two Indian navies. And I think that that sort of squarely put China and everything around it and about it in the center of discussion. And as would be expected, there are lots of questions there. First, of course, is from Commodore Datar, who asked, how credible is this threat of China? Then that's supplanted by Manish Gupta, who says, uh, even if we console ourselves that the quality may not be good, but the quantity is humongous, and therefore should we not factor for that by building up our own numbers? There is another question, I think, by Arun Yadav, who says, look, they are all over the Indian Ocean, and then there is a recent port city bill. How is the Indian Navy handling this Chinese challenge? Now, on the other hand, and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of correlating this question here, uh, there seems to be a general consensus that the Indian Navy needs to do something up its numbers quotient at least. Uh, that seems to be the consensus. On the other hand, there is Rahul Vankade asking, are three aircraft carriers a practical economic option? So maybe you would like to take both of them together and see how, how we can stand up to the Chinese challenge. Shikan, we have another two hours? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that you have to ask Professor Anuradha, not me. Yes, because if you are going to be sitting down and start discussing the credibility of a Chinese threat, their presence in this region, the naval strategy vis-a-vis -vis China, it's going to take a couple of hours. Uh, and some of it is, is, is going to get into classified domain, but uh, let's, let's take it one at a time. Credibility of a threat. 
what constitutes credibility? I'd say there are three, three aspects to credibility. Capacity. Capacity, let me, let me spell them out, then I'll, then I'll discuss them. Capability and intent. Now, let's look at the capacity of the Chinese, the PLA Navy. The capacity, as I said, has been growing at the rate of 10 warships a year over the last decade. And which warships? We're talking of the latest generation warships to get some destroyers. At par, weapons, sensors, systems, sustainability, they've proved it. They have the 48th task force without stop is entered the Indian Ocean just now, short while ago. Since end 2008, they've been able to sustain this without a break since then with no bases in the region. Now their bases are going to start increasing as time is going by. If they could do this without a base in the region, what more will be will be the capacity once they have capacity ashore as well as a port. So don't ever downplay the capacity that they have got. The shipbuilding capacity, the ship and shipping industry today is 40% of the global industry is just theirs. In the top 20 ports of the world, 16 are Chinese. That's the kind of maritime power that they have developed or maritime capacity that they have developed. The maritime industry is humongous and it's been built steadily over the last four to five decades. It's not just suddenly happened. Now that you're finding it shifting from the basics, the port infrastructure, the shipping infrastructure, the shipping industry, the, the civil uses of maritime technology is now finding its place in the military defense industry, the maritime defense industry. And that culmination is what you're seeing over the last decade. They're producing close to 10 ships a year. That's what they're churning out. Now that is the, that kind of capacity was last seen when? That kind of capacity was last seen in the Second World War with the United States. That industrial capacity, that capacity was seen with the erstwhile Soviet Union at that particular time, five decades ago. In modern times, who do we see with that kind of powerful capacity? Anybody. In, all of it brought together and culminating in military industry. Today, the Chinese maritime and naval capacity is overtaking the US Navy. They're poised to overtake the US Navy. Now, that is as far as the capacity is concerned. Let's look at capability. And some of this addresses other questions also quality versus quantity and, and uh, where China is going. Capability is a measure of the skill. The skill that somebody has developed, it's not what you said very correctly, this quantity, but it's not quantity in just incapable numbers. We're not talking of 1,500 fishing boats. We're talking of 300 modern warships. We're talking of 100 crack frontline fleet combat ships. So when you talk of that, that quantity, it is highly, highly capable units, units which have got immense combat capacity. Now, when you talk of the skill and knowledge that they have picked up, well, just look at one simple example. All estimates by all international analysts, uh, when they bought the first, the hull of the first aircraft carrier, the erstwhile Varyak, and which the commission is leoning was, they will take five to 10 years to get the ship out to sea and take 10 years plus to be able to operate aircraft from there. China did it in less than five years, all of it together. All of it together. Today, they have three more aircraft carriers under construction. They have been able to, on the learning, prove all their aircraft for launch and recovery. They've been doing, now they've got task forces uh, with the CBG operating. Do not underrate what capability they are developing at this time. So the capability, the skill, the knowledge that they are acquiring uh, can be reasonably seen to be some proportionate measure of the capacity that they have developed. Third is the intent. Okay. The most difficult one. How do you guess somebody's intent? All the, all the outreach to you is friendly. And then suddenly, Galvan happens behind your back. You go there with empty hands to try and negotiate and somebody launches a sneak attack on you. How do you grade intent? Very, very difficult. So let's focus on capacity and capability. And if at all you need signs of intent vis-a-vis -vis the maritime frontier or the maritime dimension is concerned, just look at it. Till 2008, the 
Chinese Navy had not come in into the Indian Ocean for more than 500 years. From 2008 to now, you are already at the 48th continuous task force. You had hardly any ports of call. Today, there's hardly any place that they are not present. They don't have any bases. Now they've got at least two which are owned by the country and probably more that they got into engagements. They have huge maritime relations. They have maritime stakes. They have engagement with us as well. So if you look at the pace at which they have grown across and say put any factor of that into military capacity, military capability, both in hard numbers as well in any assessments, uh, it would not be prudent to try and discount it in any manner. Now, question which came in on India's carrier battle groups, what is practical, what is not practical, I totally agree with you. Our, our, our defense budget is limited. Uh, you have to try and put the money where it can provide you the maximum gains. But let me put a counter question to you. If you don't have a carrier battle group, how will you protect these sea lanes? How will you ensure that you have naval and maritime power present in the area of your interest at the time that you need it, the sustenance over there? When you say CBG, essentially, this, what is the CBG bringing? The CBG is bringing in mobility and firepower. Firepower by itself can be static. Mobile firepower means you can deploy it wherever you require. Mobility with firepower can be provided by an aircraft. So what does an aircraft carrier provide? Mobility, firepower, and sustenance. So the three things that a CBG brings in for you is carries the firepower, it provides the carrier-borne mobility of which air power ashore can provide, and also provides you the sustenance because it's a moving airfield on around. How many do you need? Do you need it all? I don't think there should be any doubt about it. If you need it, please look at your areas of interest. With these areas of interest, at any given time, if you have three CBGs, you can deploy two. That means in two theaters, you can deploy them. Personally speaking, I think three is less. Shrika. Wonderful. Personally speaking, I think three is less. That's a very, very uh, sort of uh, revealing statement. And, and at one point of time, actually, naval history, our planners had gone at one point of time, even thought of four aircraft carriers in our blueprint, uh, which tells you that, uh, you know, even in 1947, when we had less than half a dozen sloops, uh, there was no want of audacity of hope amongst our naval planners. Uh, that, that is very clear. Now, there are still lots of questions coming in, ladies and gentlemen. What I'm trying to do, I know a lot of you asking, but I'm trying to combine three or four uh, sort of questions together to see if we can say, uh, stay on the same theme. So we'll come back to China. There's something on the Arctic road. There's more on ecology and environment. But let's go to human resource development and a little bit here where Mumbai University can also take note. Uh, one, uh, Sri Muthuraman asks that, look, there is lots of information you're giving. This seems very nice. It's new, but most people in India don't know about it. We have to find a way in which maritime knowledge has to go to universities. Can we have a dialogue with NCRT, with UGC, and a range of institutions so that everything from fisheries to offshore security to all that you talk should figure in the curriculum? Uh, that is, there is a similar question uh, in, in a different way by uh, Dr. Radha Srinivasan from physics department. Uh, she's asking how can we make students in our center, students in university, uh, you know, sort of uh, collaborate with the center on certain maritime issues. So one is broadly about uh, maritime subjects in the educational framework and how the Navy and CMS can come into play. Uh, sh shall I follow that with another human resource question or you'd like to take this on? Let me, let me try and handle this much. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm getting into areas, not my core expertise. Okay, but uh, I couldn't agree more with you on the on the need to enhance maritime awareness and maritime consciousness. Uh, it is telling that right in the beginning, our plans papers, our plans papers essentially also incorporated the strategy and the doctrine in those were highly classified. It is it took us 
40 years before we brought it out to the highest classification and then started splitting into two different documents. And we said, at least across the Navy to start with, uh, we need to make this available to more people. And we brought into lesser classified subjects. And those were under the, uh, under the eyes and auspices of Edmund Ramdas, who I think was also present here. He can still be there, sir. And we brought these two documents out in the late 1980s. Then we moved forward and started bringing more of them out in the open domain, suitably spreading it. So just as within the Navy itself, we've realized within the Navy, our own maritime and naval education system has adapted to say we need to move things out from a limited field to have a broader base knowledge and spreading. I think long ago, at least two decades ago, this step should have been taken of spreading it down to universities. We have been perhaps well behind the curve, but that is why the initiative that has been taken by the University of Mumbai with the Center of Excellence for Maritime Studies is, is such a laudable one because it seeks to plug exactly that gap of getting out to the universities, bringing in these subjects and that too with an interdisciplinary approach because as you see now at sea, it is interdisciplinary. You cannot call maritime studies as belonging to humanities or to science or to law or to commerce. It's all of it all together at any given time. And that is exactly what the CMAS is bringing in. It's bringing in courses of training in an interdisciplinary approach. And that is why I think so enthused and enthusiastic about this initiative of theirs. Should this initiative be replicated elsewhere? Absolutely. I think every major university in the country, especially those on coastal states, need to have a CMAS of their own. In fact, all these CMAs should be plugged in together with each other. So they're able to resource pool with each other, complement each other, support each other. Have such in initiatives taken place in bits and pieces. In bits and pieces, you have, of course, the Indian Maritime University is doing a marvelous job, but that's basically focusing on shipbuilding and commerce aspects. You have law universities and maritime law universities, which are there, you've got the Gujarat uh, Law University, which is also looking at maritime law subjects, which is looking at certain other aspects of it. You have the Central University of Gujarat, it's got the School of National Security Studies, which has a center for maritime studies. So you do have an increasing amount of outreach at the universities taking place on these subjects. But as I said, till now, most of them are looking in niche and subject areas, science and technology, law, arts, humanities, strategic studies, security. All of this have to be brought into one, one ambit, giving specialists and students from each respective field of interest and expertise to be able to pull together in an interdisciplinary manner. And that exactly is the way forward. And that is what Mumbai University is, is started now with the Center for Maritime Studies. And I couldn't agree more that this needs to be replicated. This needs to be expanded. This needs to be exponentially enhanced. And certainly it's something which the Indian Navy and the Naval War College in particular have been very supportive of and will continue to remain supportive of. The second part of the question that you spoke about, how can uh, various other universities collaborate and cooperate with Center for Maritime Studies? But that's an area I would rather leave to Dr. Anuradha to answer, but I can just offer a couple of suggestions here. Get into dialogue one-on-one, -on -one, have exchange of faculty, have exchange of papers, send students across on cross-pollination visits for short research uh, fellowships, uh, get into an arrangement to serve certain share these syllabus and lectures and classes. Most of the lectures today would necessarily need to be in this online format. You could subscribe to some of those lectures. You could sponsor some of the programs of the CMAS. The, the answer in the maritime world lies in cooperation and collaboration. The answer in the maritime academic world mirrors the maritime world. It lies in cooperation and collaboration. It lies in an inclusive approach. It lies in resource pooling and working with each other so that we are able to enhance and complement each other. So really, where can you support? I'd say just about everywhere. Start with the syllabus. Uh, get into a dialogue with the CMAS. See the syllabus. See your syllabus. See common points. Resource pool for faculty. Resource pool for students. Get into joint projects. Get into joint studies together. Get into faculty exchange programs together. Actually, there is a huge, huge scope out over there. This is just my preliminary initial thoughts. I'm sure if you take this on offline later on and have discussions with Dr. Anuradha, the CMAS uh, will be able to offer you many direct practical avenues for doing that. Shikhan. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot.
Uh, I think uh, you know you mentioned Admiral Ramdas, and and he actually uh, mentions that multidisciplinary is the way to go forward. That is what you had also said. But there was an interesting uh, comment made by Mrs. Ramdas earlier, wherein she says that the resources required for ensuring human resource security and well-being, mm -hmm. this human security must surely form the basis of national security. And China has made some strategic decisions in the early years, and hence their ability to do all that they are able to do today. So I'll take from there that comment to a very interesting question asked by Commander Ankit Shandilya, where he is asking, how do we do this trade-off between capability and capacity constraints with regard to our human resource management? Now, what he's further going on asking is that you have disruptive technologies such as swarm, drones, um, artificial intelligence, and a whole lot of new domains which are disruptive in nature. And he suggests that uh, corporations or entities that are very good at doing business the traditional way are very bad at competing when disruption happens. In other words, uh, the very thing that is very good now may seem to be very bad in a disruption environment. So I suppose the unstated question is, is the Navy geared up for wars of future? Thank you, Shrikant. I think each time, uh, can you hear me? Yes. OK. Each, each time you throw a question or somebody from the audience throws a question, I keep wondering, do, uh, do we have enough time to address each of these? We could have a seminar on each of these subjects. We can probably trade views. And I think Commander Ankit has, has hit it absolutely spot on, isn't it? You will always have a struggle between capacity and capability. The two are not mutually exclusive. In fact, if anything, they have to be mutually complementary. Because there is no point in having capacity without capability. And you cannot have capability without having the capacity. The two have to be built together. One could argue somewhat like the, the cart or the horse, which do you put first? Do you have doctrine first or do you have the technology first? The real world answer is whatever you get first, but you catch up with the other one fast. You can't ignore in an idyllic scenario, you should have had a concept first and then develop the technology and then mutually integrate them so that you have a consolidated capacity and capability outcome. In the real world, you will keep adapting because technologies are changing. Historically, it has been defense technologies that have migrated to the civilian world and then have led change in the civilian world. The R&D was military. In India, it's been the other way around because we never had a stronger military industry. The civil industry necessarily has been the first one to kick off. So we have learned to adapt civil technologies to military use. Today, the world and the entire cycle of technology of military versus civil is changing in the same manner. Disruptive technologies are more often than not coming out in civil uses first and then are getting adapted to military as opposed to what used to happen to 20 years ago. Now, as far as conceptually and our human capacity is concerned, India's capability, we keep using the word Jogart, is a wonderful article by, uh, uh, by Komra Golaya in the latest uh, Naval Dispatch, where he says Jogart is not a bad word. He says de-idealize de Jogart. It is the Indian innovation skills of being able to adopt and adapt. So today, when we are talking of disruptive technologies coming in, and you just ask me one question, do we have the ability to absorb disruptive technology? I don't even know. Because that's how we've done it. Who else in the world has been able to mix and match uh, sensors and weapons taken from diverse sources, integrate them, work out doctrines which will make them work, and take them through better? Who else has been able to take military equipment that were meant for coastal use and purely defensive use and use them in an offensive role? So we have been able to adapt, innovate with whatever we've got and extract much more out of it. Historically, as Shikan says, look at the history. We've been able to do it. Today, are we studying enough of disruptive technologies? In the civil world, yes. In the military world, as I said, as and when it's coming up, we are watching and we're trying to adapt. it. Can we do better with it? Absolutely no doubt about it. Absolutely no doubt about it. Are we gearing up for wars of the future? Certainly we have not taken our eye off it. As I said, you cannot but hope to keep working for the most dangerous as well as the most likely at the same time. Now, 
to what extent are we ready beyond my pay grade i will not be able to assess that to what extent are we ready other than trying to tell you you are you're absolutely right when you say disruptive technologies create new vulnerabilities and disruption across over here change the way in which you will carry out a practice all together which makes things redundant the way swarms the way drones have done the way artificial intelligence is threatening to do the way quantum communication will do in the future are we cognizant of it absolutely we are cognizant of it are we studying it yes we are are our iit studying it yes we are iit madras has got a fantastic disruptive technology section this headed by janan shankar they doing a lot of studies neighbor war college had interaction with them and, and we were absolutely gratified to learn the kind of innovative studies that are being carried out across over there what about in house you are aware that the navy itself has set up the the naval uh, initiative and innovation organization which is giving a boost to patents that we have done most of the jugards and again i use the word in not in a derogatory term but in a laudatory frame that we have been able to innovate have been done by serving naval personnel in house whether it was with the vessi when we started with the integration of sensors and weapons in one manner or we talk of a maritime domain awareness system that we created or we talk of the sonar that we created or we talk of many other issues that we are moving forward yes i think we are very much cognizant and very much capable are we able to do it at the pace at which a threat may develop i think we can i think we are chika thanks thanks so much uh, ladies and gentlemen yes uh, questions are still coming in i'm glad we still have some more time uh, and what i propose to do uh, there are a couple of questions uh, that relate to the future of underwater force or uh, what are the plans for lakshadweep i'm sure the questioners will agree uh, that much of this may pertain to classified domain and i don't think this might be the best place to discuss that here uh also what i uh, intend to do probably give a bit more space to the questions given by not not from the uh, naval experts but a little bit more from the non naval faculty citizens so uh, some of these questions now relate uh, to foreign policy to our posture in maritime diplomacy there is one by meera badre she is a faculty in sndt women's university and she asks a question with regard to small island developing states uh, she says our maritime neighborhood has quite a few small island developing states that are crucial to india's maritime interest there is much talk over quad on the east but sir it seems our strategic community seems to neglect the role of sids in ior please illuminate on the possibility of something similar on the lines of quad or more maritime security based arrangement treaty that can be developed with these maritime partners i while i'll go to admiral uh, i'd like to inform uh, uh, you know uh, 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 mira ma'am that look uh, i i think in one way your question is valid because it talks of increasing expectations of the indian navy uh, in doing much of maritime diplomacy but i don't think it's quite correct to say that our strategic community depends on how you define that strategic community seems to neglect the role of sids in ior uh, i think probably you will not you would have seen that indian navy ships over the last couple of years uh, particularly in samudra setu 1 and 2 and mission sagar have concentrated a great deal on small island uh, developing states and our partnership with all of them with seychelles mauritius madagascar maldives uh, has been in some ways unprecedented if you see how naval ships have been a very regular part of it uh, does it need to be enhanced should it come to the level of quad i think i'll i'll uh, let admiral uh, take on that part of the question thank you shikant dr mira that's a very good question uh, when i say very good question i'm going to cover what all we have actually done because uh, i don't agree with your contention that in any manner the small island developing states have been ignored in fact i think they have been at the center piece of both the diplomatic outreach as well as the maritime strategic outreach let's go back to 2004 we can go back further go back to the 1980s go back to the 1960s all through there has been an outreach to mauritius certainly been outreach to the maldives been outreach to sri lanka been an outreach to the seychelles outreach to the comoros it's been that throughout but let's just take it take 2004 tsunami when the tsunami hit india 
In 36 hours, we had put out 27 ships and 5,000 people. Spread across four countries. There was a special task force that sailed to provide succor to the Maldives. It went at absolute what we call sail with, sail with full dispatch. In 36 hours from Bombay, the task force was present at Maldives and stayed on task for the next two months. Providing succor, providing relief, providing HDR. Same thing was done with Sri Lanka, same outreach was provided up to Indonesia. Since 2009, we have been carrying out joint EZ surveillance and patrolling with Mauritius, with Seychelles, with Maldives. At regular intervals, once in six months, four to six months, ships have been going and spending one to two months in the waters of Mauritius and Seychelles in joint action with them for enhancing their, their surveillance, their maritime security. Because the mantra has been capacity building and capability enhancement. We have been reaching out through training, we are reaching out through equipment, we are reaching out through presence. The, don't forget that the, the entire concept of Sagar was enunciated where? It was enunciated at Mauritius by the Prime Minister in March 2015 on the Mauritian National Day at the time when the Barracuda was, was presented to, to the Mauritian Coast Guard by India. So whether it in terms of deployments, whether it is in terms of detachments, whether it has been in terms of equipment, training, engagement, the island states have been foremost in our engagement. We, the entire, if you have a look at the maritime security strategy, it, it has one strategy called, and I mentioned it in my talk, shaping a favorable and positive maritime environment. What does that mean? It essentially means that as you are engaging all the countries around, because it has to be in a participative, cooperative manner. You're reaching out to each of the countries and saying, all right, where can I help you? Where can you help me? So that we are able to build a benign environment, build the capacity of each of the maritime forces, who each does his bit, and the other one is willing to reach out and help out through protocols, through engagement, through training, through equipment. The CRS system, the coastal radar and surveillance system that's been set up across all the island states has been sponsored and pushed by India. Been pushed by the NEA, built by BEL, uh, supported doctrinally in any in, in foreign cooperative terms by the Indian Navy. We have regular staff talks with all of these countries. We have regular port visits. We have regular exercises. Like I said, every six months, we have ships which are there in Mauritius and Seychelles. Anytime there has been a difficulty of support required for HADR, the first responder for each of these states has been India. When you had a difficulty of a water crisis in uh, in Maldives a few years ago, I think that was, uh, was it in, in 2014, uh, that they had a water crisis. Once again, it was, we diverted a ship to provide portable water. Ships, aircraft flew into provide water, we provided a tanker, which came in there and provided water. So whether it is HADR or it is SAR or it is anti-piracy patrol or it is generally boosting the maritime security in the region, the actual centerpiece of the Iowa outlook has been the island states. In fact, they have been these, they have been the sign of self. And from there it is expanding to the others. So that is why I disagree with it that we uh, have not been looking at the island states. I'd rather say the entire maritime outlook has started from the island states and spread outwards to the other countries all around. That's what we have been doing. Insofar as the second part of you said, maritime security, that's right. Maritime security partnerships, I could agree with you more. But when we talk of engaging, that's exactly what we have been doing. Today, the Indian Navy has staff talks with more than 20 navies. The entire concept of the ION, the Indian Ocean Naval Symposium, of bringing together the 35 navies of the region. Right? Today, we have uh, 23 members and I think about eight observers today. The robust relationship that started way, way back in 2008 and various other engagements, the conclave of chiefs, the Goa Maritime Conclave that is hosted at the Naval War College, the professional interaction through the Goa Maritime Symposium between the various navies, the recent initiative of the Indian Naval Dispatch, which has also been spread out amongst the navies. All of this is so that we work together because we are, as I said in my talk, very, very cognizant that our dependency on the seas is very high for our own interest. So is it for our partner countries and navies in the region. And none of us has the capacity or capability to deal with all of it by ourselves. So best is to do it in an inclusive and cooperative manner. 
which is what we have been doing throughout for the last four to five decades and certainly over the last one to two decades. Is there something that I missed or you'd like to come back on, on, on to me with this? I'd be happy to take it on. Shikan? Yeah, uh, thanks so much. So what I'm going to do now is, is we've got about 15 to 17 minutes uh, before we sort of wind up. So I'm going to give you one bumper question. It, it will be an over of six bouncers. Uh, <laughs> you, you, could, you could probably uh, note them down and, and I'll let you sort of answer that. I'll, I'll club most of the questions and probably this would be the last but this should be the last set of questions before we this one so that you can sort of, uh, you know, uh, see if you can combine and see linkages there. Uh, and by and large, this broadly concerns the future. How do we see uh, the future going on from here? From Commodore Vasan, it is uh, that despite best intentions, we are not probably succeeded in managing our maritime neighborhood due to deep pockets of China. So. What are our long-term and short-term options with regard to China is one set of question. The other set uh, that relates to future comes from uh, Pankaj Sharma, Neville Malav, and uh, one uh, Shri Das Gupta. Uh, that relates to uh, commercial shipbuilding. How can it augment warship building? Neville asks, how do we enhance our port infrastructure and hinterland connectivity? And uh, Das Gupta ji asks about indigenous shipbuilding. So that broadly relates to what is the future you see with regard to commercial shipbuilding, indigenous shipbuilding. Uh, the third one relates to does China have some sort of an advantage further with the opening of uh, the Arctic Ocean route uh, that is from Dr. Chaya Goswami. Uh, the fourth one relates to theater command and what is the future and does uh, can we, uh, I think Commander Vadera asked and a few others asked about theater command. Uh, the fifth question relates to Navy's role in enhancing maritime consciousness through a lot of measures. Some who have complimented, some who have said, uh, you know, we need to do more. And the sixth one on how we can enmesh this with ecological preservation. I think a lot of questions relate to ecology and, and that. Uh, so, so broadly, uh, five or six questions, one relating to future with regard to China, second future with relate to port and domestic infrastructure, third theater commands, uh, fourth uh, North Sea route, fifth uh, environmental consciousness, sixth maritime education. So uh, there, the floor is all yours. <laughs> Thank you, Srikant. Are you going to ever give me a question that I can wrap up in 30 seconds with a yes or no, which I'm more comfortable with? Uh, okay. Even if I did, you wouldn't wrap up. In, in <laughs> okay, right. Let's let's let let me give it a try. Uh, some some of these, as I said, were not part of the core talk, but let me give it a try as best as I can. What can we do in the maritime neighborhood, short term and long term, especially with an eye on China? So that's exactly what we have been doing. Let's not let me not focus and limit it to just an eye on China. Our maritime interest will remain our maritime interest, whether there is a second or a third or a fourth country present or not. So we have to first focus on what and Bilu Chuan would often call India-centric strategy, rather than have it focused on anybody else. So let's let's look at, I, I've tried to enunciate or give you a kaleidoscope of the vast area of maritime interest that we have to bring out one and one fourth point that our destiny is very strongly linked with the safety and security of the seas around us, the safety of the sea lanes around us. So anything and everything that we do that enhances maritime security in the region is becomes the mantra both in the short and the long. Now, how do, if that is the goal and vision is to enhance the net maritime security, how do we go about doing it? As I said, and is there in the maritime strategy document briefly, we try and shape a favorable and a positive maritime environment. What is favorable? That means the environment is by and large benign. You try and inculcate friendships and linkages where you try and bring in a shared understanding of maritime interest that, look, this is in everybody's interest. But what is in everybody's interest? Security cannot be exclusive. That it's your security, but it's insecurity for me. That'll, that will lead to fissures, that will lead to conflict. That is why the basic approach of Sagar is being what? Security and growth for all in the region. That's why I said it so succinctly and fantastically encapsulates the entire maritime vision. That what all do we need to do? We have to work together. 
So if the way to develop a favorable maritime environment is working together by engaging others, by having a common and a shared understanding to start with, how do you do that engagement? Well, you have ions, you have the Iowara, you have the Navy to Navy staff talks, you have exercises, you have visits, you have ship visits, you have delegation visits, you have exchange of, of students and training, all these are possible ways of enhancing engagement. And this I'm still saying is primarily on the naval front. The same thing now gets translated into the academic front. Same thing gets translated into the industry front. In the industry front, the shipping is already there. As I mentioned, you have ships being built in one place, owned in a second country, operating under a company which is third place, cargo of a fourth place, crew of a fifth place, and some of the cargo and the crew changing on route. So that entire synthesis of many countries working towards it, each getting something out of the common project remains one of the ways in which you try and build a favorable environment. Then comes to the second part. What about a positive maritime environment? Positive is in case there's a threat, are you able to counter it straight away? In naval parlance, I'll call it the attack party. There's a fire that is broken out. Are you able to quickly respond to that fire by and douse it while it is still small before it becomes too big? Which means you need to have greater capacity. You need to have greater presence. And you need to have greater interlinked and coordinated presence. What have we done through all the anti-piracy patrols? We've had independent deployers, including China, including Japan, including Russia, including uh, Korea, where we worked with each other and worked out our timelines of schedules in the, in the period of highest piracy invested time. We said, all right, each of, the, each of the countries which is going would take on a convoy of ships from any nationality, and you would take on at least 12 hours later, and the next country would take on 12 hours later. So you had a seamless flow taking place, so there was no overlap, and there were no gaps. Now that lasted, and that was one of the major reasons why ships were able to be safely escorted to piracy uh, infested areas. That remains a perfect model later. Even now, the shared model, the shared awareness and deconflict is, is still very much there. The same model applies any time that you have any maritime security challenge that occurs, and you need to initiate an operation. And it is not just for one country, but for others. You work in a shared manner to a cooperative and a coordinated route. As you do this, you build up your linkages. You build up your mutual dependencies and support. And this you're doing for your own interest. Now, vis-a-vis -vis China, I said, China has interest in this region. They've been increasing. The capacity has been increasing. The capability, we can take it, has been increasing at some factor of the capacity, but certainly very, very rapidly. Don't, don't underrate. The intent will, will be something which will be shown now and again, uh, whether it is shown at Galvan or it is shown a dollar, the intent will keep getting shown once in a while. You need to have the mechanisms in place on a perennial basis. We need to have engagements with the countries, the maritime community, with the navies and the law enforcement on a perennial basis. As you build up your linkages, as you build up your strengths, as you build up a favorable and positive maritime environment, that itself reduces the scope of misunderstanding, that reduces the scope of leaving the floor open for somebody else to get inside. Let me leave it at that particular point to say, we need to focus on what will promote and protect and project our national maritime interests. If we are able to do that, the other parts of areas which could be, where these interests could be targeted or could be denuded in some manner, will also get addressed to a large, large manner in this, to this room. Second issue on shipbuilding, I couldn't agree more with you. Uh, the answer is Sagar Mala, isn't it? It's a brilliant idea. The challenge, of course, lies between a brilliant idea and its execution. The kind of infrastructure support that you're talking of building up is revolutionary. You're talking of building up these ports. As I said, you look worldwide today. 16 of the world's 20 leading ports are all in China. That hasn't happened in a day. It's happened through decades. Through absolute focus strategy with the finances and the project management. The answer is that. We have to replicate the way the Japanese shipping industry is built up, the way the Korean shipping industry is built up. Our shipping industry also needs to draw examples from that and build itself up. Is it happening? Yes, it's happening. Shipbuilding, if you look at just the Navy today, we're building all our ships, we're designing all our ships in house. We're building our ships in house. Only some niche components where we may not have the technology, the expertise, what we're getting. Today, we, we, we speak of the float move 
and five components. The float component is entirely ours today. The move component is two thirds ours today. The pipe component is one third ours today. And slowly these proportions are increasing year on year. So we are talking same way commercial shipbuilding. There is no, it is, I, I give you the figures that our shipbuilding is growing at a faster pace than the global average. But that is, will it be enough to meet our needs? Not for decades. Does it mean we don't invest in commercial shipbuilding? Of course we have to. How do we do it? We need infusion of technology, we need infusion of investment. How do we do that? We need to get into partnerships. Are we getting into those partnerships? Yes, we are. Can we do it more, faster, better? It's going on. Nobody's, nobody's not got an eye on it. Sagar Mala project is exactly that. It's all about port infrastructure development in, in building of the shipbuilding, the entire industry and the hinterland connectivity. Now, what you're seeing happening in front of you is the hinterland connectivity because that is grabbing your eyes. I gave you the data and figures of the port infrastructure. Five years ago, our turnaround time at our ports average all, all India was more than 100 hours. It was about 104 hours. Four years ago, it came down to 96 hours. Now the average is down to 60 hours. In some areas, we are at par with the global average because you're talking of dry cargo, you're talking of container, you're talking of ore. There are many categories of cargo and turnaround time. In some categories, we are at par with the world. How have we done that? You've seen the year-on-year, year, I gave you the data of the figure, year-on-year year improvement of the cargo carrying capacity. More than 4% per year is our cargo carrying, the cargo handling is increased at all our ports. How does that happen if the port infrastructure is not growing? What about the ancillary of from the finances to the labor to the, to the companies, the downstream, the shipping? Well, never you're the better expert than I am, but, but just one look at the data shows that it is very much happening. And as I said, please understand, please remember, Sagar Mala is not a one-shot project to get over in one or two years. It's envisaged over 20 years. And when you envisage something over 20 years, don't count 20 years into 365 days. There will be setbacks. There will be places where you'll advance much better. There will be areas where you have to reevaluate and see its financial viability. There will be environmental concerns. So that question on ecology comes back. What do, you, what do you opt for first? You opt for a port where there may be some green concerns or do you wait till you resolve those concerns and move forward? So while you have a plan and you're sticking to the plan and there is enough data to show that your movement is happening, it's not just underway, it is making way. It's making way steadily moving forward. Is it moving at as fast as your and my aspirations? I think our aspirations will always be faster. Isn't that the saying that uh, a man's reach must always be better than his grasp? Otherwise, what, what are the heavens for? So we will keep aspiring to move further and forward, but do we have a plan in place? Do we have projects? Do we have an infrastructure to support it? We do. Is the shipbuilding actually growing? It is. Please take a look at the data. I'll, 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 I'll share that data offline with, uh, with you if you would like. Our shipbuilding is increasing. Our, the size of the ships we are building, the tonnage of the ships we are building is much more than it was five years ago. As I said, our growth of shipbuilding industry is faster than the global average. But it will take many decades before we reach the stage where the Far Eastern countries have reached. Arctic sea route. Yes, Arctic sea route, a lot of studies have been done. In fact, I'll refer you to some studies. And, uh, and, and uh, in fact, there's a compendium of a couple of seminars by the National Maritime Foundation on this, that as the Arctic melts, it will make the routes shorter, definitely more so for China than for us. For us, it may not make that much of a difference. But for China, it will certainly make a huge difference in the amount of time taken for shipment from the Atlantic onto Chinese ports. Well, it's good for them. It will make a huge change for Russia. It will make a huge change for China. It may make some change for Japan as well. What will change for India? Our routes still remain the same. Will the traffic through the IOR reduce? Not really. Marginally, at best. Is the melting of the Arctic something that we're very positive and sure about? What are going to be the uh, environmental and climate effects? Will the economy of the Atlantic countries be the same if the Arctic were to melt and the Arctic sea routes open up because of environmental damage? Nobody can say. So Arctic sea routes and study into the Arctic is certainly an area of huge interest, of long-term strategic interest. And India has an Arctic policy. You remember a little while back, there was a draft Arctic policy that we put out for public comments by the National Security Council. 
So we are looking at it. We have teams that are looking into it. We are studying it. NMF has been studying it. But certainly the melting of the Arctic will not have as much an impact in direct terms on us as in indirect terms. And it will have an impact on China and Japan. It will have an impact on Europe. What that impact is, I think we still are several years away before we are able to exactly catalog the degree of that impact. It will not change in direct terms our national maritime interests or our national maritime strategy or our maritime security strategy. The question on theater commands of the area, if I can best say it is subjudice. It's under active discussion right now as we speak. This has been reported on in the press. Uh, the, the genesis and knowledge of it is available in the public domain that we're working towards integration and increasing jointness. What shape and contours that will take, all of the best plans have to pursue a dialectic and an iterative process. That process is on. It's been going on for several years. Many ways been going on for decades. We've been arguing and discussing it. Right now, it is what I'll call... Uh, for those of you who remember NDA parlance, we are at Pashan. Now you're at the last stretch of, of the run where it becomes very active, which includes you do get into how are you, what are the shape, exact contours of it that are going to come out. Right. Well, the, the right people are discussing, examining every area and aspect of it so that we are the best considered decision. Let's leave that at that particular issue. Navy's role in enhancing maritime consciousness. That's exactly why we are here today. Uh, absolutely we support it. Uh, with being the practitioners, uh, with perforce, the Navy has also got a little bit into the theory as Admiral Chauhan, eternal guru for many of us in my generation, has, has always kept telling us there is no gap between the theoretician and the practitioner. It used to be the same. Or you go back to Thucydides, who said you can't have too much of a gap between the thinking man and the fighting man. So definitely the Navy has also been doing a lot of thinking in-house and has been reaching out to maritime experts trying to share the perspectives and build a common maritime consciousness and awareness. We've been trying to do this both in the country, in engaging industry, in engaging academia, in engaging think tanks, as well as outside the country by engaging other navies, other maritime agencies, other maritime thinkers. Can we do more? We are more than willing to do it. In fact, the inauguration at the inauguration of CMAS, uh, the chief of naval staff has promised University of Mumbai, all support from the Navy. And uh, that's exactly why both Srikant and I are here today. And uh, we would continue to do so in any capacity, in any manner that we can reach out and, and support. The Navy has been doing it. The Navy will keep doing it. Because finally, as I said, it comes back and flows back into us. The larger maritime consciousness enhances all our perspective and fine tunes our strategy. Ecological preservation couldn't agree more with you. It needs to be done. We can't damage the ecology, but, but for example, for many years, the Navy's ability to carry out gunnery firing on a certain rock became subjudice and got blocked because of environmental concerns. At the end of a decade, it was shown and proved that those environmental concerns were exaggerated and misused. But for that decade, the cap capability a very important naval capability got denuded to a certain extent. Now, how do you draw the balance between your security and your growth? Are they mutually exclusive? They cannot be. Same as with ecology and environment. The Navy believes in green technology, believes in supporting ecology. We've been trying to build our bases to become smart bases. Wherever the Navy's gone, we've been trying to support green initiatives. At the same time, a balance needs to be drawn. I mentioned to you a couple of the ports which have been given AIP to become major ports. Why have they not advanced faster? There's a query just now to say, what about a port infrastructure? Because there are ecological concerns. Can you ignore the ecological concerns? Certainly not. Can you ignore environmental concerns? Certainly not. Who is expert enough to be able to draw the line and say, this is of concern and this is not of concern? Have you built that expertise as of now? No. Well, one answer is let's build that expertise. Let's get back to the universities. Let's get back to the CMAS. Let's get back to the other uh, think tanks and say, please invest in the expertise for somebody to be able to tell us so that we can come to a better decision faster. There are various places where, whether you talk of economic development or you talk of military use, where there would be a seeming conflict vis-a-vis -vis the environment. How much is actual conflict? How much can we live with? We have concerns about the air quality. Do we stop living in the cities because we have a concern about air quality? 
You need both to go together. That balance can only come out if we have enough expertise. Otherwise, we are wasting years and decades. Today, because of a lack of adequate consciousness amongst all of us as a larger maritime community, our ability to be able to decide whether something is of maritime concern or not is coming into contrary views and conflicting views, which necessarily takes more time to be able to resolve. That time carries with it an opportunity cost. That time carries with it a financial cost. Of course, there is no doubt that because of those environmental concerns, you don't want to take a step which becomes irreversible and another environmental cost becomes much higher than your financial, material or security costs. But how do you draw the balance? We need more experts. So on this particular account, I'd simply say, let's have more studies on ecology in concert with the development agencies, in concert with the maritime security agencies, especially involving the Coast Guard, which has got a niche role in preserving the environment and fisheries. And with that building of that expertise, we may be able to come to swifter decisions whether something is inimical or not. And if so, how do we do the mitigation? Shikan. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you'll agree with me that, uh, you know, uh, uh, Admiral S.J. Singh did the equivalent of Garfield Sobers or Ravi Shastri or Yuvraj Singh. He hit six balls for sixes, all of them. Uh, giving us certain splendid responses in a sense that encapsulated much of what we had discussed. Uh, I would at the very outset, I mean, uh, like to thank Admiral for what I would describe simply as a, a magnificent magisterial overview of the maritime world. And I think he brought out so many issues that we need to pause, we need to think. Now, it's the job of a moderator not to sort of uh, uh, repeat all that he has said, but for the sake of you, as I brought out in the beginning, uh, enthusiastic college students and others who are not veterans, I'll try and act as a step down transformer, sort of relate some of the issues that he has said in a nitty gritty, in a very small thing. He's brought out lots of them in granular detail. Now, one of the things I'd like to begin with is an incident that uh, uh, one of our common friends, Colonel S.M. Kumar, put out. Uh, where he said one of the proudest moments that happened when he was doing the course in UK with Admiral uh, S.J. Singh, then Lieutenant Commander, they did the course one year after the nuclear, uh, you know, uh, tests had taken place in India. And as per Colonel S.M. Kumar, he says the proudest moment for me was when the whole Western world was arrayed against us and Admiral S.J. Singh uh, spoke 30 minutes continuously, 27 minutes continuously, and did such a wonderful defense of India's nuclear test that he had a standing ovation from those who were opposed to it. So I guess in some ways, this talk of his today needs a standing ovation too from all of us for his ability to consistently articulate a wide range of maritime concerns and maritime issues. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Amongst the few things that he brought out, and it's important to remember, I think he brought out about capabilities and intent, intention. And we learned long ago that while it takes years, perhaps decades to build capabilities, the intent can change overnight. And I think that is something we need to be very careful with friends uh, or those who are not so friendly in the international landscape. So our ability, therefore, to read the tea leaves with regard to the intent has to be sort of very uh, well calibrated. Uh, it must become a fine art in itself. Many of us have spoken, for example, about 2008 Beijing Olympics as China's coming out party. But in 2008, China's coming out party happened in the maritime realm too with the anti-piracy escort force and many people perhaps did not read the tea leaves similarly with regard to that then. Now you see where they have come, as Admiral has brought out, 48, 49 continuous escort cycles of the piracy force, a whole lot of developments in our region. Therefore, our ability to read these uh, must be important and for which, again, we need a whole lot of academic support. Um, the maritime word, as has been brought out in lots of questions and answers, has straddles several concerns. It straddles so many disciplines, domains, 
And if you saw the question answers today, this in some ways reflected the width, the depth of that domain, and in some ways the tension, for example, between uh, security and environment, between expansion and economy and budget and all of that. And I think future learning has to be about straddling some of these, what might seem contradictions to see how we can balance that. I'm, I did not take some of the questions. Captain Subeda, uh, for example, your question on marine policy was perhaps relevant, but it did not, as they say, figure in the syllabus here. It would have been unfair to our speaker to have asked him about marine policy. But in a sense, again, that reflects on a whole lot of issues uh, that come to bear upon the, the uh, maritime realm. In the middle of all this comes one point consistently, which is about uh, the capability of our human way. And that is where maritime consciousness comes in. I think when Admiral S.J. Singh talked of protecting, preserving our strategic interests, at the end of the day, it is done by the man behind the gun. He has to be a scholar warrior. She has to be a scholar warrior increasingly. And therefore, the only way to do it is for us to be continuously educated in educating ourselves. And that is where organizations like CMAS have a huge role to play. Once more, I'd like to compliment the Mumbai University on their initiative. And I'd like to end with a very small personal anecdotal note, which in a sense, uh, you know, since environment and ecology came, and that was the last question that Admiral S.J. Singh answered. Uh, in 1992, when uh, the Rio summit was happening, uh, I wrote an essay on the Navy's contribution towards ecological housekeeping. And at that time, I was given a rap on my knuckles and said, this is not what young naval officers should be thinking of. Go back into war fighting and concentrate on that. And therefore, uh, it was clearly a different age and silo. 30 years later, uh, you know, or 28, 29 years later, I gave a talk in Xavier's College on the Navy's contribution to ecological housekeeping. Admiral S.J. Singh talked about it today. Recently, we had the word Environment Day where the Navy came out in a big way with several green measures that we have undertaken. It tells you of the long journey undertaken by the Navy itself and in being able to handle these complexities and take them in our stride. It tells you of the long journey that Admiral S.J. Singh and I have undertaken uh, in, in the Navy over the last 30 years. And in a sense, as CMAS begins its journey, I would like to wish them the best of luck and also make them aware that the maritime domain knowledge vidya consists of harmonizing and synthesizing all these different aspects of which Admiral S.J. Singh gave us a fantastic kaleidoscopic view today. So with those words, thank you lots, ladies and gentlemen, for being with us, for being very patient with all that we discussed. Over to you, Professor Anuradha, for taking it further from there. Thank you, Commodore Kaysnood. Indeed, it was a two hours of a brilliant, uh, splendid engagement. And I think we are very good with time. And the best part was that uh, Vice Admiral Sanjay uh, had an active talk for one hour, and our discussion went on for almost one hour. And as you said, we have close to 245 uh, participants joining in. And uh, there was such a, what do you call it, um, a plethora of questions coming in from all domains because uh, Vice Admiral Sanjay's talk was having such a wide spectrum of coverage. And as you mentioned, Commodore Kaysnur, I myself am in awe of his knowledge and his understanding of this domain. So I have the privilege to propose a vote of thanks and uh, first of all, I would like to thank our resource person, esteemed speaker, Vice Admiral Sanjay Singh, for his wonderful, wonderful talk. Somebody, I think Professor Jairaman from BARC, uh, former BARC uh, officer, he, he was uh, one of the top officer of BARC, mentioned it's the rarest of rare talk. And for a common citizen like me, a civilian, as you call, I think it, it was like it was, um, it was uh, very, very informative and enlightening. And uh, uh, Vice Admiral Sanjay, I would like to take back four words from you, which you uttered in response to one of the question, and that is, we can, we are. And that gives me a lot of assurance 
in spite of whatever concerns are you know are uh, are uh, hovering on us in spite of exponential augmented uh, maritime prowess of some of our neighbors and in spite of that i'm sure uh, india's diplomacy and strategists like you at the helm of indian navy and other armed forces can take us you know to can help us fight and uh, 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 what do you call it defend the country to the best in the best possible manner thanks a, a lot and uh, i could make out our moderator uh, commodore kesnoor uh, srikant kesnoor you and him you go a long way back from your nda days when you all were young boys and that uh, he was fielding the uh, the balls or the questions and uh, the googlies and uh, you were batting uh, you know maybe like ravi shastri those days and uh, and uh, i could see the jugal bandi you see there was a jugal bandi between commodore kes noor and vice admiral sanjay singh and which was very evident the ease with which uh, you tackled so many questions and thanks to commodore kes noor the way i could see the myriad of questions so many questions how would you sort of you know conglomerate them and do justice uh, thank you very much commodore kes noor for your wonderful moderation and i would like to tell our esteemed guests who have joined us today that vice admiral sanjay j singh and commodore srikant kesnoor are members are esteemed members of the board of management of the center of excellence in maritime studies of university of mumbai plus they have been instrumental in the design the concept note uh, of uh, and also laying out the uh, the road map for the cmas in the same breath i would like to thank our authorities honorable vice chancellor professor suhas petnekar who has sent in his greetings to our uh, speaker and moderator and he said this is his dream project uh, our pro vice chancellor professor ravindra kulkarni i would take special mention of my co dean uh, dean of humanities professor rajesh karat who joined us later after a session thank you professor karat i would like to thank uh, rear admiral uh, 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 commandant of naval war college uh, sai venkatraman for his continuous support and i don't miss the presence of uh, 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 dr sanjay singh there because now uh, uh, rear admiral uh, sai has been helping cmas to a large extent again thanks goes to the dignitaries of university of mumbai for joining in today dignitaries from indian navy i could see the big contingent and brigade from the indian navy wonderful questions being posed i'm sure you all must be you all are so lucky and privileged to have such uh, seniors and officers who groom you who mentor you and must be uh, contouring your thoughts and your professional careers you all are lucky the country is lucky and privileged to have uh, uh, the top brass like vice admiral sanjay and commodore srikant kesnoor in the indian navy board of studies members of maritime studies thanks for joining in my colleagues principals head of the departments many of them have commented uh, you know vice admiral sanjay our academic shins my fraternity are really very happy to hear you speak many of my pharma colleagues i am basically from the pharmaceutical field many have joined it and i think they had a great time great understanding public perception is very important and as you said maritime consciousness um, as uh, dr barucha also mentioned indeed madam and to all who have proposed center for excellence in maritime studies is looking for concrete collaborations and engagements with other organizations to augment and expand our scope of projects and uh, and also expand and improve uh, optimize the curriculum uh, which is offered by uh, the programs in the programs of cmas last but certainly not the least all the participants who have joined in from all the different verticals thank you very much you have made this very vibrant Uh, the questions and answers were were very well taken, and I think probably uh, at the back end later you can always coordinate with uh, Vice Admiral Sanjay Singh and Commodore Kesnoor to seek some of the queries which we could not answer because of paucity of time. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Miss uh, Murunmai Rane, the coordinator, young budding oceanography specialist, who is there uh, with us. Uh, as a coordinator and i would also like to thank rohit from university uh, computation center uh, department of ict thanks rohit for your it support and with this if uh, if the speaker and the moderator permits we call it a day and you please have a great day shubh divas for all of you 
and uh, then we can leave the session. Is it fine? Uh, thank, you. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Kassandra. Thank you very thank much. You. Thanks a lot. Thanks, thank you. thanks to all. Thanks a lot, ma'am. Thanks. Thanks. Mm -hmm.